when I joined his, Mr. Khanna, actually was my mentor. I personally feel the time has come. We need to focus more on receiving residents revenue than the numbers. Tourism over the years has shifted from regimented tours to experiential tours. Hello and welcome once again to nepaltraveler.com. We are back again with our weekly Nepal Travel Trade Talk. And today we have a very interesting, experienced and a person who is well respected in the tourism industry. A veteran who has seen all the ups and downs, who has been at the front of most of the challenges facing Nepal's tourism industry. And I would like to welcome Mr. Vijay Amatya, CEO of Koda Tours. Hello, how are you? Welcome to our show, sir. Thank you. To start with Bijadai, maybe you could tell us about how you started your journey in tourism. Well, when I finished my master's degree, <clears throat> and I, you know, actually I love traveling. So one of my friend's father, he used to be president of Rotary Club. So he told me, since you, you, know, you have done, finished your studies and you, you, know, you hold master's degree in marketing, so why don't you give a talk to the industry guys about tourism? So I agreed and I decided to give a talk on challenge of marketing Nepal as a destination. And that's now I'm talking 76, 77. Because those days, Nepal was receiving tourists either add on to India or add on to Thailand, which was three nights. So we in our language used to say two transfer and three half day sizing. That is half day sizing of Kathmandu, half day sizing of uh, Bhaktapur, Paspatnath, Bodhnath, and and then half day of Pas you know, Patan and Tibetan refugee camp. So I decided to, to talk about this. And after the talk, I met a gentleman who used to be the managing director of those days, Yeti Travel, called Mr. Khanna, JL Khanna. And he asked me, what are you doing here now? Because those days I was trying to pursue my PhD. So I had applied already in the States to do my PhD. I told him, well, I'm, I'm trying, you know, uh, for my PhD, sir. He told me, well, as long as you don't get your confirmation, would you like to come and, and help me with marketing, which I agreed. So I joined Yeti Travel. <clears throat> and I started promoting special interest tools to begin with. So I would do the costing. I would do the correspondence. And once the group used to come, then I used to lead the groups <coughs> myself, like photography to yoga to you know uh, bird watching, butterflying, to have the mushroom hunting, you know, those kind of stuff. And it really picked up very well. And then after I took over the entire marketing department, traveling globally all over presenting Nepal to the different you know, markets and trying to promote Nepal as a destination by itself. So I would go and request everyone, please come to Nepal, do all, it, all your you know, sightseeing, all your holidays. I'm going to design uh, the cream de la cream you know, of Nepal, visit Nepal and then after you can forget, you can travel on you know, other destinations. And once you have time again, you can come back again. So that's how I you know, entered uh, the tourism. Any and this now, it is now almost like 49 years being in the trade. And in those early years, sir, do you remember anything or anything that strikes you still 
because you worked with the Yeti Travels, which was the travel Later, agency, yeah, and Mr. Kanal, who was one of the Kanal, pioneers yeah. in promoting Nepal. Uh, any memorable incidents, anything, learnings that you'd like to share? Oh, yeah, Miss, when I joined, his, uh, Miss, Mr. Khanna actually was my mentor. <clears throat> so he would always say, if you really want to be successful in this trade, always think of customer's service. Put it at the top. Customer service is the real ingredient of tourism promotion. Once your client has happy, once their holidays is made, they will go and tell their friends. So word of mouth is the best way of doing the marketing. So I learned my first lesson in tourism from Mr. Jail Khanna. You know? And this today is really real in me. So now the company, you know, I've created, this is a part and parcel of the game. This is the foundation of my business. And would you tell us a little bit sir, about Cora Tours? You're the CEO now of Cora Tours, you founded that company. Well, after living in the travels, I decided to join hand and created Cora Tours, which we focus only for the affluent client. Doing something very different than others, what others are doing. Like we do luxury tours, we do wellness, we do adventure tours, but mostly to the affluent clientele. This doesn't mean that we, you know, we don't take lower end, we do, but then our main focus is, is on the luxury client. Because now I personally feel the time has come where we need to focus more on you know, receiving end, receiving in a sense, revenue than the numbers. So the Quora tour right now is more, we are more focusing on the money we make than the number we're trying to get. So that means we believe that we need to earn respectable money only after providing service, you know. And it's, it's quite reasonably charged. Now it does mean it, we should be charging exhibitant you know, price, which is very reasonable, but where we could earn a respectable money. Because after all, this is a business, you know, it's not like a charity organization. And this is where so far I'm quite happy the way it's going on. Business is increasing over the years, you know, <coughs> year on year is, is increasing. Even the next year we see a big, big increase going to come. So also looking at Nepal as a destination over the four decades when you started and today, how do you see the industry in Nepal? How that has evolved? How has people's perception of Nepal? Well, in early days, Nepal was like a Shangri-La. <clears throat> so we used to get what we call uh, an explorers. Those people who wanted to see Nepal in its originality. So they were rushing to come to Nepal. They're willing to take the hardship, but willing to you know, spend money as well. We didn't have that many hotels in Kathmandu. Infrastructure was very poor. Flights were very limited. <clears throat> so, but we still were getting those like clientele. Because in tourism, initially it was started like what we call a regimental tour. It means there was group tours. People who join in groups, they will have limited time. You go and do the sightseeing. They would sit, you know, seven o'clock, you have seven, seven thirty breakfast, nine o'clock we leave, mm -hmm. do the sightseeing, come back to hotel again by twelve thirty one, have your lunch. Then by 2, 2.30, you leave again to the sightseeing, come back, very much regimental. Now, tourism over the years has shifted from regimental tours to experiential tour. Now, people like to come here to do, to experiment, you know, miss experience things. They want to see how the local people they live, what is, you know, the food habits, how they live. And a lot of guys now, they want to go, say, Bhaktapur and they stay maybe more than two hours or three hours which is not possible if they are in a group, you know. And if it's a group, it's just like a family or a very small group of, of mm -hmm. you know, like-minded, so they could spend more time there. That's, that's what is happening, you know. And now from there, for the last 10 years, it's been shifted from experiences to, to transformative tourism, where people, they come to Nepal and then 
they, they see that there is a transformation going on within them. And Nepal is one of the places for this kind of transformative tourism. So that's why we are rich now slowly. So we now fundamentally focusing more on experience and tourism in Nepal, experience. So where we feel we could provide something very different than other destination, which in Nepal is definitely where we definitely have, you know, natural beauty. We have very friendly and happy people. Those who are very friendly, tourist friendly people, you know, nice environment, good food, good recommendation. So that's, that's caught up now. So there is also at the present moment, a kind of backlash to mass tourism. Many destinations are mm -hmm. averse to it. I mean, we've had that in Spain and other places. For Nepal, how do you see the way forward? Because you were talking about luxury, uh, tourists who want to immerse in the experience. Well, the government definitely wants mass tourism. We, the industry, you know, the stakeholders, we want to make a very fine balance between number and the revenue. If you ask me personally, I would rather go for revenue than for the numbers. Because if we have large numbers, they will exhaust all our resources. And in return, we gain not much, gain little. But if we could focus on those clientele who are looking for very much comfort, luxury, you know, they like to spend more time in Nepal, you know, and have a very good experience. So that's what the government should be doing. And we also should be doing, focusing on that one instead of increasing the numbers. Eventually, it might come. Like we have a little bit of test of mass tourism, not in other places, like in Kathmandu. We have this test a little bit at the Everest base camp, the climbing. Where you find, you know, there are 200 people trying climb. to climb Everest, you know, on one particular day. It's filthy, you know, even at the top. And if we have more and more like this, then can you, can, you can just imagine what is going to be to our, our mountains. So we have a little bit of test. We don't see in Kathmandu so much, but we do see an average base camp. The other challenge that perhaps the destination Nepal is facing is because now we've had so many new hotels that have come up, especially post-COVID, international chains have entered. So the supply of rooms is far more than what it was. Will that allow us actually to earn more or to, to have I don't higher think spending? So. See, unless and until the supply meets demand, there will be no optimum. Oversupply is going to pressurize bring the, price the price. No hotel will get the rate what they really deserve because they are oversupply. So they will be buying to get the same same business at the lower rate. Unfortunately, our government did not think of doing a serious study about the supply. Whether if we could have done a demand forecast, say for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, we would have known that we need this many hotel, this category hotel, because there is an age group, you know, because we know someone at, you know, young 20, 25, 35, will not be able to pay so much as someone 55, 65 or 75. Okay? So that's government should have known. We should have done this studies. Since we have not done the studies and license been given at random, so yes. the other way, other way to look at it would have been is to create demand for the destination. We should have gone to different markets and create demand for the destination. Do the marketing, you know, spend more money on the marketing in our traditional market as well as the emerging market, you know. And then next thing is we should have thought of bringing more international airlines because only creating demand is not enough. We must know from where they're going to fly in, which airline they're going to fly in. Because the state of our own national airlines is not you know, uh, up to the mark. So we're depending on the foreign airlines 
and all the foreign airlines they are here just to make money if they're not in profit if they don't get the right customers they, they will leave today you know so that's what that's what the condition is what do you see as the biggest challenge to this uh, this bottleneck we now have an oversupply of rooms but do we have the infrastructure do we have the airports uh, and what kind of capability are we able to take in can we bring in that many well let's let's be a little bit you know optimistic if we improve our infrastructure especially the road <coughs> because right now traveling from Kathmandu to Pokhara it it's takes 10 hours it's a nightmare Kathmandu to Chittagong you know takes almost 78 hours and that is our the main main touristic centers Kathmandu Chittagong Pokhara you know this is like or or for say Lumbini so that infrastructure should be improved we need more accessibility by air and the surface as well and then we need to start thinking ki how we going to use two our two additional airports bairwa and pokhara where which airlines we could bring in if not outside from how we could use that airport for our own airlines so that will be you know that will help to bring in more tourists quality tourists that's what we need for right now if it's not possible then we should think especially for bairwa we should think okay from all these buddhist countries how we could bring a charter flight you know even if we have 10 15 20 30 charters you know from all these places cambodia laos vietnam japan china, china you know taiwan myanmar sri lanka at all that will help a little bit and then slowly some of their lines will, will join in only thing government needs to think ki what facilities government is going to go give because we should know and we should be very clear in this nepal is not a cheap destination it is not nepal is already in high cost economy reason being whatever we bring in because we don't have own support we have to so either we have to use railway to bring into you know from up to the indian border from calcutta port or, or chennai airport or from mumbai airport or from the seaport yeah. and bring into our railway station and from there we truck them in now the cost of transportation is high just because to buying a vehicle one will have to pay 230% tax on it so that increases the transport is cost and every goods is expensive even and you know, over for the common people <coughs> secondly because our landing cost our parking fee and our atf you know airline turbine exactly. fuel cost is high the air fare is high in nepal so whoever is coming from abroad they always feel the air fare in nepal is high so nepal is not a cheap destination you know so we should stop talking about nepal is a cheap destination it's not now the what the other way we need to start need to think ki how we could take the best advantage of this situation so we need to go to the market tell them we don't you know it's not a cheap destination but we definitely assure you that when you come to nepal <coughs> you'll have a great experience even though it's a little bit expensive than other places you know or neighboring countries <clears throat> especially far eastern countries thailand malaysia singapore you know true only thing which is a little bit reasonable here is the cost of our hotel hotel rates are a little bit cheaper than than our neighboring right. countries only thailand is you know 10 to 15% cheaper than nepal that is that is you know the only thing which you feel is very affordable now nepal should think of slowly bringing those kind of clientele not you know, using all all every time all the time hostel and hostel those kind of clientele i am not saying that we should stop it but we should minimize our focus should be up there so we need to think of how we could increase the length of stay of the tourists 
and how we could make them spend more. Now, spend more it means we need to give them opportunities and the places where they could spend more. Now, in future, I think Nepal should slowly move on. Number one, to offset our seasonality. Okay. Because if we only focus on, on season, October to April, and we do not get, you know, that many numbers in, in from say from May to September. So we need to see how we could offset this. And I think if we start promoting all our festivals, because most of our festivals are in, you know, in the season, if we start focusing on wellness, on yoga retreat, on meditation, or say adventure tourism, which we could do indoors, or even medical tourism. Nepal definitely is well known in the world for eye treatment, okay, if not in other places. So if we could have international standard hospital, you know, where we could, you know, provide them services, we can, Nepal could do well, because this medical tourism is not going serious. to be 2.9 trillion dollar worth of business by 2030. And it's increasing at the rate of 19%. So there's a huge, huge possibility of increasing this. There's a wellness, if we could have wellness, you know, that is also has a great potential. Wellness is almost 6.6 .6 trillion dollar worth of business. Sir, so all these facts are there with the private sector, people like you. Don't you think, don't you feel that the government perhaps should invite these experts, come together with a, a panel, come with a tourism policy, which we've always been lacking. You've talked earlier. Yeah, we that's, what we need. that's what we need. We need a sound, sustainable tourism policy, which could guide our tourism. Based on all this yes, research, on these all facts, the research we know where they are. First of all, government needs to decide ki what class of tourists we want, what category of tourists we want. If we are looking for luxury seekers, accordingly our marketing, our infrastructure, our all the other, other facilities should be improved. We need to have the trained manpower, you know, what we call, as right now we have seen in the industry after COVID, a lot of them have left the industry. Either they are pursuing their own business or they left looking for somewhere because they had somehow or other to feed the family. So they left. Now there is there's a vacuum. So we need to think and then we need to train them because there is a different level of service needed by the luxury seeking client and those who come and stay in a hostel or hostel or in a one or two star hotel. It's totally different. So we need to turn them because their needs, their wants are different. So looking at the coming high season, what are our expectations? Do you think that we can actually meet our targets? Well, if we do marketing, effective marketing, when I say marketing, it's effective marketing. It means where we're putting money and we see that the result is coming. We'll be very close to the target. Provided by the time our infrastructure is ready. If the infrastructure is not ready, then people will be reluctant to travel. You know? Business definitely has increased. We have already reached almost 19 figure. Reaching 1.6 million, this is not a big deal. Provided we have better accessibility and infrastructure. Plus, marketing where we are really weak over the years unfortunately the marketing wing uh, our you know tourism board has not been able to function the way it had to function because of the, uh, their own difficulties so once it's it's on the right track we should be expecting more but we need to always keep in mind 
that Nepal should not be victim of its own success. And that is, we should never ever go for mass tourism. Like what is happening in Barcelona, where you have seen people, they're saying, I'm sorry, please get out right. of here. Oh. You know? Same thing you see in, in, in other countries, Netherlands. You know? You'll see this in, in, in Italy, in other places, where they're literally saying, please, we don't want you. You know, Barcelona is, is a real example right now. So we should not reach that state. So what we need to do now, if we are going for num large numbers, then we need to spread them. We need to create more destinations, more places where they could go to the east, they could go to the west. If we could say, uh, develop a ski tourism, a ski resort, you know, winter sports in the far west, Humla and Jumla, or we have a tea tourism in in, in, in in that area, so we could spread out. Then the number will also increase, and we take the benefit. But what we need to do is we should always keep in mind that we should not be having over tourism, mass tourism. We should try to avoid that one, and the only way is to increase the standard service and accordingly the rate we charge. So as a final parting shots, if you had to advise the tourism board, uh, the government, what were one or two of the points that you would say Nepal needs to be doing immediately? What should we focus right now? Well, see, it's thinking that as is where is, because overnight we'll not be able to improve our infrastructure. Will not be increase increase air chains or come out with the tourism policy. We should be thinking how we could help the airlines to fill up those empty seats so that more people will come. For that one, governments should invest more on creative marketing, digital marketing, and TV should be. I know that there should be proper CEO, that every, all the status should be functioning and they should be doing more and more of marketing, attending the main travel shows, perhaps doing the road show, they need to do digital marketing, you know, there are so many medias, the press, you know, electronic media, you know, print media, our PR, or, or our tourism, you know, you know representatives. That's what we, our embassies, you know, we should be able to utilize them, mobilize them to increase more demand for the destination so that we get more. Also, and it's possible. Also, so we have a, a very strong private sector. We have associations, travel trade associations. Do you think we also need to come more together to, to demand, to put pressure and say, no, this has to be done for the destination? Yeah, yeah. Miss, our, this, our associations are doing it. But because we don't have one voice yet, it's not very effective. All our situation, they put in their head in one and just come out with few, uh, I would say very few demand, valid demand. Two or three and, uh, very important yes, demands. Very important yes. thing, which we think they must do. Like we must have infrastructure, even at the airport, you know, if, if the facility should be improved. That will help a lot. And that's what is really, we should be talking just one voice. Thank you so much, sir, for taking oh, the welcome. time and coming here. Thank you very much. Welcome. Welcome.